and welcome to Lindenwald. This year looks a bit different at Martin Van Buren's home, but we're still excited to bring the stories of our nation's eighth president to you. And that's why we are pleased to announce our virtual speaker series for the summer of 2020. We are bringing the latest scholarship from Martin Van Buren's home straight to the comfort of yours. Thank you for joining us. Thank you all for joining us for our first installment of Martin Van Buren National Historic Site's virtual summer speaker series. Today we are sitting down with James Bradley, who's a biographer of Martin Van Buren and heavily involved in the Martin Van Buren Papers Project. Thank you for being here with us, James. Thank you very much for having me. So as a biographer and as someone heavily involved with the Speakers Project, you've spent a lot of time with Van Buren. What inspired you to write a biography about Martin Van Buren? It's a bit like asking me, uh, why did I fall in love with my wife? That question. Um, there is mystery to this whole thing about why we are drawn, and I'm talking about those of us in the biography profession, why, why are we drawn to our subjects? And we can, all, we can come up with all kinds of theories, but we have to recognize something that we, we, we become drawn to people for inexplicable reasons. In the case of Martin Van Buren, I've always been intrigued by a few things about him. Uh, I like the fact that he was the classic overachiever, that he was somebody who did not come from a landed aristocratic family, and that was a big deal up here. He didn't go to college. He didn't go to the, he was, did not serve in the military. Uh, he was a lawyer and a brilliant lawyer, and he was able to take his expertise in the field of law, which was really extensive, and convert that into a political operation. So how did he do that? Uh, that whole story of how Martin Van Buren rose from being the son of a tavern keeper to president of the United States, I think that's an extraordinary story. And I think that often gets lost because everyone likes to focus on his, his political nature, the political machinations, uh, some of the exciting tricks he used to play. That's where he got all of his nicknames. Uh, but how he rose, and it was an interesting rise in politics. There aren't that many parallels in American history in terms of presidents. Most presidents did a big leap. They would go from lawyer to say, senator, and then president. Van Buren's rise was extremely sequential. He was elected Kinderhook's fence viewer in 1805. I mean, how quaint does that sound, fence viewer? Uh, but it was an important position, actually, because what it meant was he adjudicated property disputes, and that was a big deal in Kinderhook at that time. And he goes from Kinderhook fence viewer to the county surrogate. But that's another big position. County surrogate is somebody who adjudicates uh, wills and important things like that about possessions and what to do with widows and how much money is left to descendants. So that was a powerful position as well. And from there, he becomes state senator. And then he's state attorney general. And then he goes to the United States Senate. And then he's the United States Secretary of State. And then he's minister to Great Britain. And then he's vice president. And then he's president. So you look at all of these, these linear jumps from one important office to the next. And in the process, he was an expert litigator. He was an expert legislator. He had executive experience. He had diplomatic experience. He was involved in all levels of government. And that's really unusual in US history to see somebody who rose in such a manner to the, to the highest office in the land. So how did he do that? Well, that's the story. That's where the biography comes in. And the backdrop to all of this is early US history, the entirety of it. He's born December 5th, 1782, days after the preliminary articles of the Treaty of Paris are signed. So he is born really at the dawn of America as an independent nation. He dies in July of 1862. 
two months before the Battle of Antietam and before the Emancipation Proclamation is signed. So he is there for the birth and the dissolution of the Republic. And his entire political career spans uh, a good 50, 60 years in the process. That he is there for the birth of the first party system. He becomes a state legislator right at the outset of the War of 1812. And he plays an extraordinarily important role uh, in New York State's involvement in the War of 1812. And then he's involved in the remaking of the Constitution, the New York State Constitution, in 1821. And every major event in the, in the antebellum period in U.S. history, Van Buren played an extraordinary role in. From slavery to Indian removal to tariff to banking, uh, there isn't one part from the, the growth of the nation, the Mexican War, he is playing a major role in any of these things. So when you write about Martin Van Buren, when you look at his whole life, you're looking at the history of the country. And there aren't many politicians who I think really fit the mold so beautifully like that. He had his contemporaries. When you look at John C. Calhoun and Henry Clay and Daniel Webster, they had all died thinking that they had saved the Republic with the Compromise of 1850. But Van Buren died knowing that that was not the case. He died when the the cause of the North and the cause of the Union was very much in doubt. So that, that ending on that note of ambiguity, I think, adds a really dramatic element to the story. I find biography particularly fascinating because not only, as you said, are you using one person's story to tell the story of a nation, but you're also taking a really deep dive into their life. So I'm sure you've come across a lot of stories about Van Buren. What are some of the things that surprised you the most? Van Buren is, and I speak in the present tense because I'm with him every day, uh, Van Buren is a difficult person to understand because his letters do not reveal very much about his interior life, his, his inner feelings about things. You really have to speculate about. You have to look for the language to see. Was he angry here? Was he happy here? He really kept the cards close to his chest. Uh, but of course, you learn things along the way. Uh, I was really impressed with how, in the 1820s, which was a turbulent period in his life, in 1819, his wife Hannah dies. He is removed as Attorney General of New York. Uh, his political future appeared to be uh, somewhat in doubt. He was in the midst of a, a bitter, bitter rivalry with his archenemy, DeWitt Clinton, the governor of New York. And that was one of several setbacks he, he faced in the 1820s. And that was a real roller coaster period for him. But he never uh, gave in to self pity. He really had this attitude of, okay, this didn't go our way. We're going to make it go our way the next time. And he succeeded. He succeeded often, and he did this by traveling around the state in ways that seem extraordinary to me, because we're talking about the 1820s. Uh, he had to do everything by horse and carriage, but he went all over the state of New York to meet with people, to meet with local politicians, county politicians, to meet with people who were involved in their communities. And to say, all right, we got beat really badly in this election. How can we win the next election? Because uh, assembly races were done every year back then. Uh, so there was incredible turnover going on. Uh, but he, he took a real democratic approach to these things. And uh, to me, that says a great deal about the United States uh, during this period. That they had just given more New Yorkers the right to vote. Uh, the property qualifications that were quite restrictive were lifted. Of course, I'm talking about white males. At the same time, uh, property qualifications were raised for African American voters. So for white men, the, the, inf the voter enfranchisement was really expanded. And by using, so he took advantage of that new development and he worked hard at building a real broad political machine in New York. And I think that 
set an example for all kinds of political organizations nationwide. So many things he did in New York were being emulated uh, elsewhere. People talk about the Bucktails in the Albany Regency, and they compare it to what they call the Richmond Junto and the Essex Junto. Uh, those are not great comparisons, because Van Buren had a much more extensive operation. He had all the lawyers, and he, had, he, uh, he put his people into all kinds of local offices, and they were held together through, through patronage. And so he put together a formula for building political operations that became uh, a real model for, for the rest of the country. Obviously, Van Buren went through a lot of personally difficult times, but as you alluded, the nation was also going through a really difficult time when Van Buren was president and when he was active in politics. So what are some of the challenges that Van Buren's generation faced, and how did you see him responding to those challenges? Van Buren uh, joined Andrew Jackson's cabinet in 1829. He was the Secretary of State. But he was much more than that. He was really Jackson, one of Jackson's closest confidants. I mean, they had a very close relationship. Uh, they went horseback riding every day. They met regularly. Uh, Jackson felt like he could really trust Van Buren. And he thought, OK. He always said, there's no guile to the man. He said, everybody told me what a slippery politician, but I find him to be very straightforward and refreshing. Uh, they formed this close bond. And, and then Van Buren becomes president in March of, of 1837. Uh, there was economic catastrophe, the likes of which the nation had never seen before. There have been economic downturns before, but nothing comparable to the Panic of 1837. At the same time, uh, slavery, which had always been present in, in American political life, was really coming to the forefront with the growth of abolitionism, uh, with the gag rule, with so many things that were going on about the extension of slavery to Washington, D.C., and what to do about territory acquired that would come later during the Mexican War. Uh, these were extraordinary challenges. These were major issues in American history. Uh, he responded to some of them with, 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 with courage and imagination, but obviously slavery is not one of those issues. He was, was concentrating on finding ways to keep the nation together. And in the process, he was far too accommodating with the slaveocracy. And in the process, perpetuated an institution uh, and we know what, what that led to in U.S. history. So as we talk about the good and the bad of Van Buren's life, he had a lot of moments of failure, and most notably were the three failed bids for the presidency of the United States. Can you speak a bit of how Van Buren dealt with these disappointments? Well, those particular ones, losing the election of 1840, losing the Democratic nomination in 1844, and losing the bid for uh, the White House on the free soil ticket in 1848. Uh, those came later in his life. And uh, he was very embittered by these things, very embittered. He had a hard time understanding it because a president was not held accountable for economic problems in those days. For example, the Panic of 1819, the previous economic downturn before Van Buren's panic. Uh, in 1820, James Monroe won every electoral vote in the nation, save one. So that was the biggest landslide in, uh, in US history, still to this date. So the idea that a president is responsible for the nation's economy is very much an idea uh, today, but was not back then. And he thought, he behaved like a responsible president. He didn't see the president as somebody who was supposed to steward the economy, that the economy is something it's a, he dealt with the panic. He, he tried to get an independent treasury. He, he did what he thought that was permissible under the constitution for a president to do. 
but he thought he had achievements in uh, foreign policy. And it, it bothered him very much that he was beaten at his own game. That the election of 1840, which I think still remains one of the most raucous elections in, in U.S. history, I mean, everybody knows Tippecanoe and Tyler, too. I mean, that was the Whigs campaign theme. Uh, and they had a nickname for Martin Van Ruin. I mean, this is the, you know, this, this sort of aspects of modern campaigning that we're more familiar with, with the nicknames and the songs and, uh, and the parades and all the public involvements and the ridiculing of the, of the presidents. That really all came to the fore in 1840. And the, the Whigs topped the Democrats, Van Buren's Democrats, at, uh, at their own game. And Van Buren came here to Kinderhook after that, and immediately he started planning, running for president in 1844. He turned this place into his campaign headquarters, and his children were here, and his, his confidants were here. And he really thought 1844 was, he was gonna get the nomination, and he was going to win easily because William Henry Harrison died one month after office, famously. Don't give long speeches in the rain in, the mar in March. That's a lesson to learn, to learn there. Uh, John Tyler was president, not popular with either party. He really thought the presidency was going to be his in 1844. But late in the convention, he refused to endorse the annexation of Texas. He had an informal agreement worked out with Henry Clay that they were not going to make Texas uh, an issue in the 1844 campaign. And he did not get the two-thirds necessary votes at the convention. The two-thirds vote is something that he personally put in. Uh, and uh, James Polk got the nomination and he was elected. And again, this, this, this was something where he thought he was robbed of something that, that he was entitled to. And finally, 1848, well, that's something different altogether. He ran on a third party ticket uh, on the Free Soil Party, uh, a party that was not uh, an abolitionist party as it's sometimes presented. It was a party whose main platform was not allowing slavery to extend to any of the territories acquired in, in the Mexican War. And his uh, running mate was Charles Francis Adams, son of John Quincy Adams, his, uh, his longtime foe. So it was a very interesting, but he didn't get anywhere. He didn't win New York. He didn't even win Kinderhook. He, it hurt him that he didn't win re-election. It hurt him that the American people couldn't see that he was the better man and he was the better president and he had the better party uh, for the nation. And uh, we recently discovered uh, some notes from, from people who knew him at that time who said, uh, spent a lot of time here in Kinderhook really kind of grousing about how his life went and how it shouldn't have been this way. It was different from the way he approached things in the 1820s, where I, where I said to you earlier, he kind of put the self-pity aside and said, all right, how are we going to fix this? But of course, in the 1840s, he was an older man. There was this sense that his time had passed, and he was hoping that his son, John, would carry the mantle, and that didn't quite pan out. So there was this resignation toward later in life that he didn't accomplish what he wanted to. And I think that in turn saddened him. So you brought up in your previous answer the idea of a political campaign, and one resource we draw a lot on at the park is political cartoons, and Van Buren appearing in them often in humorous ways. So one thing I think a lot of visitors relate to well is that Van Buren was funny, and sometimes unintentionally funny. Uh, sometimes he was intentionally funny, but he's still funny today. Uh, he appears on Seinfeld. He appears in these cultural touchstones, which is very interesting given that he's not one of the most well-known presidents. So is there a moment that you've come across that really exhibits Van Buren's sense of humor? You know... It's on the Seinfeld point for a moment, uh, his, his picture was also in the most recent season of Curb Your Enthusiasm. So clearly, uh, you need to get Larry David here, and you need to ask him, 
Why this interest in Martin Van Buren? Because it's more extensive than we realize. Uh, this issue of Van Buren and humor is an important one because he was the first president who didn't take himself too seriously. I really mean that. It's not to mean that he was a frivolous person, far from it. But clearly he could laugh at himself. Uh, I don't think Andrew Jackson laughed at himself. I don't think John Quincy Adams laughed at himself. I don't think uh, anybody who preceded him uh, enjoyed a good joke at his expense. But, but Van Buren did, and I think that, that speaks well for him. Uh, one of my favorite stories goes back to uh, 1828, when he gave a speech in Albany about the tariff. Now, the tariff was one of the biggest issues at that moment, because that's how the nation raised revenue. I think 90% of the federal revenues were raised from tariffs. So there was a tariff bill. Uh, people in New York had feelings about the tariff. Uh, people in the South had very different feelings about the tariff. And this was an issue that really threatened to fracture the coalition that Van Buren was putting together to elect Andrew Jackson. So he had to walk a delicate tightrope. He gave a speech here in Albany about the tariff. He spoke for two hours. It was in July. I'm sure it was very hot. I'm sure he was talking in his typically long-winded way. I'm sure he was avoiding saying things outright because we have to remember something about Van Buren. He was, above all, a lawyer. And he had this tendency to use jargon, to not be clear, to say something in 100 words when he could have said it in three. So he gave this long speech where he announced in the middle that he was in favor of raising rates on some duties. And uh, afterwards, somebody walked over to an associate of Van Buren's and asked him and said to him, that was a wonderful, able speech. And the, the associate of Van Buren's agreed with him. And he said, what side of the tariff was he on? And it's a funny story, but here's the great thing. Van Buren loved sharing this story with people. He would tell it to diplomats. He would tell it to people he met in the Senate, just everywhere. He thought it was a funny story, that's all. And uh, there are lots of anecdotes like this where uh, he just was not above that sort of thing. Yeah. And then there's, you know, there's, just, there's, the, there's the witty stuff he did too. He was once asked, uh, is it true that the sun uh, rises in the east and sets in the west? Somebody was trying to say, make a point that he'll never give you a straightforward answer to a question. So somebody asked him at a cocktail party, a very straightforward question, is it true the sun rises in the east and sets in the west? And then he just said, well, I couldn't say for sure. I'm never up that early in the morning or something like that. So, and these things are reported in the newspaper. So I thought it was good for the nation to see a president with a sense of humor who could laugh at himself. And then when you read his autobiography, to those who, who, who do read his autobiography, uh, he's always saying things like, we met, we met at a tavern, we laughed, we told stories. There's a famous uh, story about uh, his meeting Abraham Lincoln. In, I think it was 1842. Uh, and they were up all night long telling stories and laughing. So if Lincoln thinks you're funny, you're funny. So I think moments like that really help us everyday people see historic figures as human beings. And sometimes that's hard to do because these figures do really seem larger than life. So is there a moment that you felt made Van Buren feel the most human? Well, it's important to recognize something that everything about him makes him human because this is one element of the human experience. It's an element of the human experience that I think most people cannot relate to because most of us don't want to be president of the United States. But the sort of person he was, the ambition, the desire to hold high office, to wield power, uh, these are great themes throughout world history. 
Because power is something that doesn't exist in a vacuum. You have to wrestle it from somebody else. And he understood this. So when you, when you read about his really powerful quest uh, for high office, and then when he lost the high office to get it back, you really learn something about the nature of, of ambition and that, that, that thirst and that hunger for power and influence and control. But in terms of what I think you're getting at, which is uh, some of the more poignant qualities of his life, I think there are a few things that, that stood out for me. Uh, in his early life, he felt like an outsider, I think, here in Kinderhook because of the nature of the, of the, the way land and power and politics uh, was distributed in Columbia County. Uh, that even though, I don't want to overstep things, he wasn't dirt poor or anything like that. Uh, I think you would call him perhaps middle class by today's standards. Uh, but still, his, his origins were very, very modest. Now his father was Kinderhook's town clerk. His father owned land that gave him the right to vote. His, his birthplace... His childhood home was also a polling site for local elections. So he was raised in this real political environment. But at the same time, he was not a Livingston. He was not a Van Rensselaer. He was not part of all these great landed families up here in the Hudson Valley who uh, exerted inordinate control and power in New York State. And that desire to crush that old order the old federalist system. You know, there's a popular Broadway musical right now, perhaps you've heard of it, called Hamilton, which is all about uh, a federalist who is young, scrappy, and hungry. But, you know, I don't think Van Buren would see it that way. You know, he saw the federalists as the people out there who were trying to preserve uh, a different kind of America, where elites control things. Van Buren had a more ex expansive view of these things. And when he tried to vote, in the election of 1804, the Van Esses, with whom he had just had a falling out, were questioning his property qualifications. They made him take an oath. That was a serious thing back then that really had a big impact on him. Uh, he always interpreted the, these slights he was getting from the Federalists. And that extended and when he went to Washington. I think he was very intimidated when he was in the presence of Daniel Webster. John C. Calhoun, John Quincy Adams, these Ivy League educated men who had much greater knowledge about pretty much everything. I mean, Van Buren was a lawyer. He knew the law. He was brilliant at the law. But these men knew much more about history, literature, the arts. Uh, I think it was... James Alexander Hamilton, Alexander Hamilton's oldest son, who became a Van Buren ally uh, in the 1820s and 30s, who said something. He knows less about, uh, about, about world things than any powerful man I've ever known. Now, he never said that to his face, of course, but I think Van Buren understood these things, that he would join conversations and people would talk about Greek and Roman history, and they would talk about, oh, maybe music or whatnot, and he had little to add to that conversation. So I think these things made him, made him self-conscious. I, I mean, I think that's a powerful driving force in his life to say uh, not everybody gets the same opportunities, and he didn't have these opportunities, and he tried to make up for it later in life, living in this house, having the library, uh, having a bust of himself modeled after Cicero. So I think that understanding that his background was different from other people uh, really drove him and animated the kind of politics he wanted to see in America. So one of the things we've learned from you today is how important Van Buren was in shaping our early political system. And that's something that I think surprises a lot of visitors because we think of George Washington, we think of Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, but Van Buren's not often included in that Parthenon. But he shaped a lot of institutions that 
some of which we still have elements of today. So what do you think Van Buren would think of our current political environment? Uh, whenever this question is asked about George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, any of the founders, what would they think of today's, uh, today's politics? The answer is usually, oh, they would be horrified. They would weep for the nation. They would crawl back into their coffin and say, I can't look at this. Uh, I think Martin Van Buren would be very much at home in today's political environment, at least aspects of it. Remember, he thought partisanship was a good thing. He didn't want everybody getting along. He liked the idea of political parties. He liked the idea of people forming co coalitions, forming groups, forming clubs, getting involved in the political process, knocking on doors, uh, really getting the grassroots engaged in politics. Uh, I think he would like Fox News and MSNBC. I think he would like the Drudge Report and the Huffington Post or something like that. I think he would see these things as good in, in many respects. What he wouldn't like, and this I'm quite certain of, he would not like the lack of cooperation in Washington, particularly in, in the US Senate. That's something he would not like. I think in his view, the bickering, the rancor, that was for the people. And that was for the state legislators. And that was even for the congressmen. But when you get to the Senate, the, big, the adults have to get into a room and work on agreements and work on compromises. And I think that spirit has been lost for, for many years now. And I think that's something he would very much disapprove of. What do you think Americans today can learn or take away from Van Buren's life? Let me answer your question in two ways. I think for somebody who's got political aspirations, I think uh, they would find Van Buren's life really interesting and enriching, and in many ways could provide a blueprint for how to build power in America, and at the same time could see what are the pitfalls of too much conciliation and, 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 and putting aside problems for others down the road to take the, the, the famous adage of kicking the can down the road. I think that's something people who are in politics uh, could learn a great deal from. As I said earlier, he didn't go to college, didn't serve in the military, he didn't come from a landed family. Uh, that's still unusual. I mean, there's only one other president who didn't serve in the military or go to college, and that's Grover Cleveland. So. Usually in American history, you were either a military man or you were college educated and having the, that college education really opened doors for you. And uh, in Van Buren's case though, he was in many ways an ordinary citizen. And he, I think he was the first ordinary citizen to become president of the United States. George Washington and Andrew Jackson were both military men famous for their battlefield heroics. Uh, they were given credit for winning wars. Uh, both Adamses, John and John Quincy, went to Harvard. They had ample experience in, in, uh, in the diplomatic world. Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, James Monroe. I mean, one guy helped draft the Declaration of Independence. One guy helped draft the Constitution. I mean, these were iconic figures in US history, and then the eighth president is Van Buren. And a lot of people didn't like this. They just thought, you know, this, this guy isn't worthy of the office, who is he? This phrase was used over and over again. He's just a politician. That phrase was used a lot. Now I would think it speaks well for the country that someone could truly rise from more humble origins to become president of the United States, but it wasn't seen that way. There was still a heavy strain of elitism in American life back then. And the idea was a president was someone who should be above all of us. That somebody who could stand taller. And of course, Van Buren did not stand very tall. I know that's a bad joke, but I had to get that in somewhere. Uh, 
And Van Buren had a very different view of this, about this idea of a president being a godlike figure. I think on some levels, he was uneasy about Andrew Jackson because he didn't want a political party to be about one person, but he also wanted to win. Winning was important to him. And in order to win in 1828, he thought, we have to join forces with Andrew Jackson, who was one of the most popular men in the country. But I think Van Buren was a little easy about having politics being about one person. Indeed, that's why he fought DeWitt Clinton so much, because he thought Clinton was about Clinton. I think that was a bit unfair on his part, but that's how he saw it. Uh, so when he became president, I think he created a presidency in his image that I'm not here to solve everybody's problems. I'm not here to fix the economy. I am here to run the shop. If you read his inaugural address, and it's something I urge people to do if you're interested in history, because it's an extraordinary inaugural address. What do we think of inaugural addresses now? Presidents promising to uplift the nation, grand soaring rhetoric about how America's best days are ahead of us and how we are going to fix these problems and as Americans we can do this together. There was nothing like that with Van Buren. You know what he said in many ways? He said the founders bequeathed to us this system and it's a good system and it's serving us well. And now you don't really need me. Americans, you got this. You just keep doing what you're doing and our future will be in good hands. Uh, we had never had an inaugural address like that before or since. So you can learn a lot about American history in terms of you know, what he tried to uh, bring to the presidency and by extension to the nation. But to, to, to people out there who are curious, interested in history, uh, I think they can also find very interesting Martin Van Buren's life because uh, it's got a great arc to it, Van Buren's life. It really does. It's almost like the stuff of literature. It's almost like a Victorian Trollope novel uh, in many ways. The idea of, again, the son of a tavern keeper who grows up in this political environment, who's in this town of independent freeholds surrounded by people who own hundreds, thousands of acres. It's just, just astonishing when you think that Rensselaerwick is bigger than Rhode Island, the entire state of Rhode Island, that you didn't see money like that even in old England. So he grows up in this environment and he uh, gradually accumulates power and, and devises new methods for organizing, for, for winning elections. Uh, and he reaches positions of real power in America. Again, U.S. Senate, Secretary of State, Vice President, and then President. Uh, and then he's overwhelmed. He fails to address slavery. He carries out Andrew Jackson's Indian removal policies. Uh, he's faced with a devastating economic downturn. And he... he, he does not really ameliorate the conditions the nation were in at that time. He accepts defeat. He returns here to Kinderhook. And these are, according to him, the happiest 20 years of his life. The last 20 years he spends here in Kinderhook, the town uh, he grew up in. You know, a lot of presidents talk about their small town origins. Bill Clinton spoke a lot about what was it, Hope, Arkansas. But when he left the White House, he didn't go to Hope, Arkansas. He, he went to New York. And you see that in a lot of presidents. When they're running for office, they talk about the small towns they came from. Uh, but they usually settle in big cities, Washington or New York or something like that. But, but Van Buren didn't. He came back here and he was a gentleman farmer. And he was a rather good one. You know, a lot of ex-presidents, we find out, uh, Thomas Jefferson, the most famous example of where they just uh, ruined themselves financially. And that was not the case with Van Buren. He amassed quite a fortune and he was good with money and he lived this life of a gentleman farmer. So he returns to his roots 
And even though he was very embittered by, by losing these elections, I think he found some measure of solace living here in Kinderhook with his family. He had hardship here as well. His son John, no, his son Martin died here. Uh, so there was, there was personal tragedy along the way. That's something that a lot of people had to deal, deal with in, in mid 19th century America. Uh, but I think he enjoyed living here very much. I think these were the happiest years of his life in many respects. Well, thank you, James. That was enlightening, and I'm so glad we were able to sit down in this virtual way and bring some of this information to the public. Uh, so thank you so much for being here today. I had a lot of fun, Becky. Thank you. Mm -hmm.